Javier Puar points out that, quote, tourism is one of the most important aspects of the globalization of sexuality. My paper selects a tourism product, an Atlantis events gay cruise from Los Angeles to Mexico and back, and traces its production process. I employ web-based research for information on the cruise and make use of the theoretical framework of homo nationalism. The paper is part of a larger study for my thesis that seeks to operationalize homo nationalism in relations of neo-colonialism between specific states. We can talk more about my own research later if there's time. Today I will begin by exploring the theoretical literature on queer tourism, and I will then proceed to apply these theoretical insights to the particular case of queer cruises. I argue that queer cruises, while they may offer a form of liberation for their passengers, represent the globalization of a hegemonic gay and lesbian identity, which entails the colonization of local same-sex identities and practices. Queer cruises can also be read as an example of Puar's homonationalism, which constructs the global north as sexually exceptional in its modernity, while simultaneously othering the global south with reference to its alleged sexual backwardness. In sum, queer cruises are contradictory features of 21st century global capitalism, in which some queers are brought into the new homonational project, and in which the global south is sexually transformed. Puar writes that queer tourism accounts for roughly 10% of the US tourism industry, and that this percentage is growing. In spite of this, queer tourism is, quote, still one of the least researched or discussed topics in scholarly venues. In Circuits of Queer Mobility, Puar suggests that gay and lesbian identity, as it has been constructed in the North American and European context, is bound up with tourism, at least in the limited sense that mobility to achieve visibility, for example, regularly visiting the gay village in major urban centers, is a foundational aspect of gay and lesbian identity. Puar goes on to say that white gay men dominate queer tourism. Next that queer tourism is now such a formidable market force and growth industry, estimated at $17 billion annually, is evidenced by the virtual explosion in queer travel providers and organizations, queer travel magazine, magazines, as well as government promotion of queer tourism, all in recent years. Finally, queer tourism has experienced a shift from, quote, domestic to international locales. Based on these developments, we might say that the involvement of governments and the production and consumption of global gay and lesbian citizenship points to the phenomenon of homonationalism. And the internationalization of queer tourism speaks to the potential for the globalization of a particular dominant form of gay and lesbian identity. Production of the Atlantis events gay cruise from LA to Mexico begins with the manufacture of the ship itself. The Mariner of the Seas, as it's called, is owned by Royal Caribbean and is registered to Nassau, Bahamas. It is a fairly typical cruise ship, and it seems an obvious point that the manufacture of a ship chartered for queer cruises does not differ from the manufacture of any other cruise ship. The ship was built in Turku, Finland, in a period of 18 months. And given what we know about Finland's social democratic welfare state and coordinated market economy, which includes a high percentage of unionized workers, it is doubtful that this part of the production process involving Finnish workers was exploitative by international standards. However, the ship's manufacture in Finland does suggest that these ships tend to be built in the global north and sent to the global south. In other words, highly compensated manufacturing labor constitutes one part of the production process in the global north. And as we shall see shortly, cheap service industry labor in the global south, the other part of that production process. Besides the production of the ship itself, how is the Mariner of the Seas produced as a gay cruise? This is where Atlantis Events enters the picture. Atlantis Events was established in 91 and has since become the largest company in the world dedicated to creating unique vacations for the gay and lesbian community. In the company overview section of the website, Atlantis mentions that it employs a full-time staff in Los Angeles. Then at the bottom of the page, we see that also part of Team Atlantis are quote, part-time staff from all over the world who join the cruise on location, end quote. There is no further information on exactly who these part-time workers who join on location are. In fact, I contacted Atlantis Events when I was writing this paper to request further information, uh, but my request was actually denied. So, 
Um, another source that describes the cruise ship under consideration seems to indicate that these part-time workers make up the vast majority of the ship's employees, since the ship requires 1,100 crew members for a single voyage. With a ratio of 1,100 crew members to 3,100 passengers, it is doubtful that Atlantis could be profitable without the bulk of its employees being comprised of low-paid, part-time workers. There are thus two classes of workers involved in the production of this queer cruise. The well-protected manufacturing workers in Finland, the Atlantis executive in Los Angeles, and the top-level employees on board the ship constitute one class of workers from the global north, and a much larger number of low-paid workers on location, as they say, constitute another class of workers from the global south. This is no different from other large corporations that take advantage of cheap labor in the global south, except that the cruise combines cheap labor from the south and consumers from the north in the same moving space. Lionel Cantu suggests that many poor <coughs> Mexicans move from rural areas to more gay-friendly urban centers or international cities in Mexico and become employed in the queer tourism industry. While this is in fact a long-standing pattern in Mexico, it has intensified more recently with the onset of organized international queer tourism. Puerto Vallarta is an example of a Mexican city with an established local gay and lesbian population that has become popular as an international queer tourism destination. It is also a Mexican city where local queers are employed in the queer tourism industry. This is significant insofar as Puerto Vallarta is the longest stopover on the LA to Mexico cruise under consideration. Based on Cantu's conclusions about queer workers in the queer tourism industry, and based on the importance of producing a, quote, gay experience on board the Mariner of the Seas, it seems likely that many of the crew members for the Mexico cruise are Southern queers. Although most North-South cruises employ a large number of racialized migrant workers, gay cruises like Atlantis events are likely to attract and seek out a large number of racialized queer migrant workers. The third world queer worker as I've dubbed it, expands on and complicates transnational feminist understandings of the third world woman worker. One problem for racialized queer tourism workers is that the influx of gay and lesbian tourists from the north to cities like Puerto Vallarta is changing the character of local same-sex identities and practices, foisting a northern gay identity upon populations marked by their own distinct queer identities, practices, and histories. As Cantu explains, quote, it is not clear to what extent the opening of more legitimized queer space is a positive effect for Mexico's queer population, and to what extent this space is framed as American. If we follow the logic of Joseph Massad, an externally imposed gay and lesbian identity can result in significant backlash against same-sex rights in some contexts of the global south. Thus, the sexual colonization of traditional same-sex identities and practices by a hegemonic form of gay and lesbian identity may both change the character of same-sex identities and practices in the South, as well as result in backlash against same-sex rights. There is preliminary evidence that this is occurring in the Caribbean region that I focus on for my own research. Another related problem is that racialized queers who work on the cruise are unable to buy into the same global gay and lesbian citizenship that the cruisers embody. Local queers are therefore in a double bind. Um, their indigenous same-sex identities and practices are colonized and they are given as a form of rescue, I would argue, a new global gay identity without corresponding global gay citizenship rights. Racialized queer women working on a mostly white male gay cruise uh, likely feel particularly alienated in this production process. Um, now, while the production process that I've talked about thus far does not deal with homonationalism directly, uh, which is more directly related to consumption, and my longer paper actually deals with consumption and distribution as well. It does expose an important story associated with the underbelly of homonationalism. Homonational consumption is not only made possible by the exclusion and othering of the Southern queer, but also by the productive labor of the Southern queer. The majority of those who produce the queer crews are excluded from the homonational consumption of the queer crews. So to conclude, um, in this talk, in this brief talk, um, I have basically argued that the interrelated processes of homonationalism and the globalization of gay and lesbian identity can be observed concretely in the phenomenon of the queer cruise. I have operationalized these concepts in the commodity chain of a particular queer cruise. 
More research, though, needs to be done on the agency of diverse Southern queernesses to resist sexual epistemological colonization, exclusion, and exploitation. Like the Mariner of the Seas on its maiden queer voyage last year, the academic literature on queer tourism is just getting started.